Hi, this is Katie from Queen's Podcast. Just a heads up, our show does include some strong language. So if you're uncomfortable with that, this might not be the show for you. Cheers, bitches. Hi, I'm Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's, the podcast about badass women in his Catherine de Medici. <laughs> Kath de Meech. Kath de Meech. <laughs> Kathy Diem. <laughs> um, so Nathan, tell us about this cocktail. This cocktail is actually called a macaroon cocktail. Why is it called? Why 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 would a macaroon be something that because we're bringing Ms. into the mix here? Catherine Medici actually brought a lot of cuisine to France, mm-hmm. and actually one of the things that she brought was the macaroon co- the macaroon cookie. Excuse me. So we made a macaroon cocktail to accentuate that. Macaroons are fucking delicious. They're quite possibly one of my favorite cookies. And you know what else is fucking delicious? This cocktail. This cocktail. Yeah, okay, so what it is, this is an ounce and a half of vodka, half an ounce of chocolate liqueur, and half an ounce of amaretto. So it tastes like a chocolate almond cookie candy bar. It's dangerous, guys. It tastes very good, it's is dangerous. what you need to know. So cheers. <laughs> cheers. To Catherine de Medici. So she was born in 1519 in Florence. She was born to the Medici family, obviously. That's her last name. They ran Florence. Like, they, they were... Ran Florence. Her they, mom was actually like French aristocracy, mm-hmm. so she was from France. But he was Italian merchant, made a shitload of money, and but actually, like within a month of her being born, both her parents were dead. Dead, gone, dead, oft. And he died of syphilis or tuberculosis. He had both, yeah. and the mom died of this tuberculosis. So they just but, said tuberculosis for her, but for him, they say syphilis and tuberculosis. But wouldn't they both have had syphilis? How the hell would she not get syphilis? I don't know. I guess they were just like, it's not ladylike for her to have syphilis. But by the time she was born, her father was already bedridden. So he was already like on his way out. Her uh, cousin, Pope Leo, kind of knew that he was going to have to maybe step in on it. Yeah. uh, Because he was kind of the next of kin because he was a Medici as well. Speaking of the Medicis, in case anybody listening to this hasn't heard of them before, let's give them a brief description of what the Medici family meant to Italy. They, back in like the early 1400s, started a bank. And since then, they had been like the de facto rulers of Florence. And this was kind of like a new class of people. There's always been the royal class, and there's been the peasants. And they basically bought their way into and, the and aristocracy. Yeah. And they bought their, and that was new. <laughs> they had started this bank. They were merchants, and they basically started from the bottom. Now the hue. That was, like, kind of a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, they, like, uh, paid the way to be a duke. Like, yeah, and by, by the time dukes. and by the time Kathy came into the play, they were dukes and duchesses. And so the emotions towards them were kind of a mixed bag I don't think that people in Italy necessarily liked being ruled. The people of Florence didn't necessarily like being ruled by who they viewed as a bunch of fucking merchants. <laughs> have you, Nathan, have you watched the Medici show on Netflix? No. Oh, Can't say I have. I do not like it. <laughs> I wanted to like it so bad because it's like such my... Your jam. It's, it's my jam. jam. I wanted to like it so bad. So it's about Cosimo Dimici and his father is played by Dustin Hoffman. But you would expect it would be good. He talks like this the whole time to avoid showing that he has an American accent because I guess he couldn't do a good British or uh, Italian accent. The main character is played by, I don't know the actor's name, Rob Stark. Handsome. Oh, very, very <laughs> handsome young man. Um, very miscasted. Like, I don't, it I don't doesn't s- work for me. I don't me. see any chemistry between the two either. Oh, well, no. The, oh, talk about chemistry. The woman that plays his wife, like, they're supposed to not have a good relationship. But him and the woman that play his wife in that show is, like, the chemistry that you would expect from a wet towel and a pet rock. That's harsh. <laughs> like, there's That's just... harsh. That's harsh. <laughs> Katie, there... you went there. <laughs> it's just nothing there. Anyway, I won't talk about that show anymore. Don't watch it. Medici family had three popes. <laughs> Medici family, they had, they were very powerful, and they had pope, papal connections. They were like running the show. So basically, like Catherine Medici's life early on, everybody freaking died. 
everyone. It's else. like if it's she like, was in your care, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. <laughs> Don't take this child in. Yeah, because literally, like know. she went to live with her grandmother, and dead. her grandmother dead. Came in the came <laughs> and then, and then to the care shit. of the pope, her he's, cousin. He's dead now. He dies. <laughs> So don't fuck with Catherine. Don't. <laughs> Poor baby Catherine. I know. She got like, she didn't have anybody to no, take care of her. No, she actually had like a really fucking sad childhood. Um, when, so in 1527, so I guess she would have been about eight years old, the Medicis fall out of power in Florence. And there's just basically like this angry mob running Florence. There was a war between Italy and Spain, or Pope and King Charles of Spain. Spain was just super power hungry and they sacked Rome. And so the Pope was too busy to help with Florence. Kathy is then hopping around from convent to convent. Because the Pope, obviously, that's the natural place to put her. To hide her. But also, um, for her captors, that's where they were putting her sometimes. So she was treated well the pope was like okay whatever i'm i'm just gonna make peace with charles this is obviously long story short it was much more yeah it was much this. more involved than that but he was like i'm gonna make peace and then after he crowns charles holy roman empire he's like help me with florence Oh my god! So what is the, what is appointing somebody the Holy Roman Emperor? I don't Emperor? know what Holy Roman Empire is. I've looked you mean at Emperor uh, Empire. <laughs> I don't know what the Holy Roman Empire you nor do. the Holy Roman Emperor is. <laughs> Neither one. I think it's a state of mind. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's basically like the Vatican appointing some dude. Be like, hey, you got power, but power over what? I don't know. Roman do you, Emperor. Do you know that or is that your guess? That's my guess. I have no idea. That's my guess. Like, I feel like every time I'm reading, like, a history book, I totally understand. King of France, King of Spain, King of Italy. I guess not really King of Italy, but King Holy, of England. Holy, Holy Roman, Roman, Roman Emperor. Emperor. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody please educate us, because we apparently have too short of attention spans to learn what that is. But anyway. So, whenever Charles was marching, the people of Florence were... were Totally trying to find a way what to do with Catherine. They were like, oh my god, the Holy Roman Emperor, whatever the fuck that is, is coming. Catherine is like a bargaining chip. Yeah, they're like, we know that there's there's now a... So the first Medici Pope had died, but now there's a new Medici Pope in control, Pope Clement. And they're like, we know once she gets freed, she's going to be a bargaining chip. She's going to help further the Medici line. We... Should get rid of her. So these are some of the suggestions that the angry mob had for disposing of Catherine Medici. (laughs) Um, Keep in mind, at this point, she's fucking 10 years old. 10. So some people suggested that she would be handed over to a mob. Like, just hand it over. Hey, hey, we're just going to rip her apart in pieces, you know? Some suggested that she be, because she was in a convent with a high wall, that she was put into a basket and lowered down over the wall naked. She's ten, y'all. Oh, <laughs> and she's some of the know. people in the this mob, the worst su- one. some of them like suggested that she would be put in a brothel so that she a wouldn't... military brothel. Uh, so like the mob could just go and like pay to have their way with her, so that she would no longer be a marriage prospect. Yeah, she'd be, her virginity's gone, she's now just a whore. Like, that's so, she's 10 years old. I feel like it's a, like, recurring thing with royal children that they have really sad lives. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, but, But, oh my god, thank god she is saved. Before she got saved, though, she thought, like, worst case scenario. I mean, could you imagine you're a little kid thinking, hearing the angry mob screaming for you? You're thinking all these horrible things are going to happen. So she (laughs) shaves her head, starts dressing like a nun. It's unclear if she actually, like, took her vows or not. It's kind of like Sister Act. Except in the 1500s. (laughs) So it was like, so replace Whoopi Goldberg (laughs) with Catherine de' Medici. And that's what it was. She was like, you can't hurt me now. I'm a bride of Christ. Would you do that? And they were like such a Catholic country that she thought that that would save her. But luckily Charles saved her. Oh, thank you, Charlie. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Charles. (laughs) And she gets sent to Rome to go live with Pope Clement VII, her Medici relative. And during this time, this is whenever she really started, because she's out of a convent. So she finally goes to Rome and it's like, 
oh my god, the Italian Renaissance. Oh my is god! And so she her mind is open, expanded. and she is just getting all She's this knowledge. She loves the arts. She loves ballet. Still to this day, like people perform ballets that she loved. Yes. She loves opera and art, and she's just the typical Renaissance Italian. Yeah, no, she totally was. And whenever she met uh, Pope Clemmy, he, I, I, I picture this, like. Pope Clement was on the ground with his arms wide open yeah. and she's running up to him with tears in her eyes and they're both crying and oh, it was just here like this I am open us. <laughs> So yeah, I definitely think the Pope was very happy to see her. I do. Happy to see that she was alive and well, but also Because she was a bargaining chip. Yeah. <laughs> he started shopping around for her husbands. And at First, actually, they were going to marry her off to the King of Scotland. And they had a fat dowry, too. Like, oh. it was, a lot of money was involved mm. in this. <laughs> they had stacks on stacks on stacks. Mm-hmm. And so they were going to go to Scotland because Scotland, super Catholic, and obviously... And Italy was super Catholic. So it was going to be a really good match until the King of France stepped up and was like, hey, how about my second son? And the Pope was like, yes, please. Fuck yes. Yes, please. Because they love that there's France and the Vatican are like peanut butter and jelly. No, it's like, like they everybody. They want them to be together. During the Renaissance, everybody had a hard on for France. Everybody wanted their kids to marry into the French royal family. And so he was just like, bye, Scotland. Which is funny, though. Because Catherine Medici, that that king of Scotland that she was like slightly, they were talking about marrying her to, she ends up being that king's daughter's mother-in-law. Ooh. That was Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, yeah. We're definitely going to be talking about her later. <laughs> One day, for sure. But they both married each other at like 14 years old. 14. Henry, like 14. So they marry her to um, Henry, who is the second son of... Of the King of France. And he really didn't have a happy childhood either. So, okay. (laughs) And he had a hard life, too. You would think that the two of them would, like, be peas in a pod because of, like, the shitty childhood they had. We're like peas and carrots. (laughs) Peas and carrots. Again. (laughs) They were not, okay, they weren't well suited for each other, but I do want to digress for a hot second to talk about... Henry's life, because I don't think we'll ever come back to this in any other podcast. And, and it's think, some fucked up shit. I think it's worth noting. So when Henry, I don't know his exact age. I'm going to guess and say he was about six. His dad, Francis, it was Francis was his dad, right? Francis the first. Francis the first was warring with Spain, which I guess was like the style of the day. Everybody warred with well, Spain. They're next door neighbors. Yeah. They got to fight. So they were warring with Spain, and they Spain and France came to an agreement, and it was like, okay, to make sure France sticks to their side of the agreement, we're going to hold your oldest and your second son hostage to make sure you stick with the um, deal. So they sent him off when he's like six or whatever to Spain, and at first he stays in like a pretty lush, like, he was living the good life, but like as a hostage. But then... <laughs> His dad doesn't stick to the the bargain. And so he keeps progressively going to worse and worse situations. Uh, Francis I was fucked up father. At the end of the day, he was in he was in prison, I believe it was for four I don't I'm not sure if it was four or six years. It was an even number. <laughs> <laughs> he was in prison for I mean, you go through, let's say he went when he was six, whether he came out when he was 10 or 12. That's a long time as a kid. That's a long time for a little kid. (laughs) For a little kid. And by the end of it, he had been living in like a fucking dungeon or something. And so he didn't have a particularly happy life either. So anyway, he comes back. And when he's 14, they're like, we're going to marry you to this Italian merchant's daughter. And what do they do? They get married and have a huge celebration. Medici style. So it was like the style back then when two huge households came together, it was like six days of partying. They would have masquerades, they would have plays, they would have jousting, all that good stuff. So this was no exception. And then like on their marriage night, this is why I don't like Francis. This is why I just, Francis the first. This wasn't. Let me preface it with, this wasn't uncommon. 
but it's still weird. It's still so, a little creepy. <laughs> King Francis is part of like the marriage contract or whatever. He has to watch his son and Catherine Medici consummate their marriage. Oh, like, okay. Can you imagine having sex and having your father fucking watch it? Like, and you're 14. 14, that's so funny. And so it's gross. obviously Blech. our first time, definitely. Ew. So let me explain that, like, back then, um, so these huge, like, dynastic marriages, they were basically, they were business contracts. They could be null and void if the marriage was never consummated. So that really wasn't that uncommon back in the day. People would come, there were cases where like the whole court would come and watch and make sure it was consummated to see that these, to make sure that the contract was um, valid. Now we just sign a contract. <laughs> Does it make it less creepy? No. No. No, it's still like no way. And like her dad even quoted something like afterwards oh, and he, he like oh, said oh, that gross. This is so gross. when he put them to bed he said I went to see them jousting and indeed each of them did joust beautifully what, what? the fuck what the fuck guys what? this is disgusting that is so like, gross. and she was 14 so it was obviously I mean I don't know about him um uh, but it was definitely her first time ever having sex so to have some guy like <clears throat> Just like, oh, just ignore the guy in the room? I don't oh, really gosh. know. gosh. So she's, obviously, she's finally made it to France. So finally. <laughs> and she actually does, despite all of this crap, she brings she, some class. Yeah, she brings At first, she's very well received. She brings over, like, ballet, side saddle, macaroons. macaroons. Oop, 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 hey, oop, oop. cheers. No, and she also delicious. brings, like... Uh, the theatrical events, ideals, like architecture. She, she I mean, was short, so she wore high heels at her wedding, and that's like when high heels came into fashion. I want trendsetter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As a short girl, feel ya. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, like, okay, let's be real, she wasn't that cute. Like, she, she was, was a little frail, a little pretty. thin. She had these bug eyes, which I've read was like staple of the Medici's they all kind of have like these bug eyes like she wasn't super cute and Henry was underwhelmed was super (laughs) not into her underwhelmed I feel like is an understatement (laughs) he just like he just wasn't that into her it was not a love match at all so what do you do as a French king you find a mistress (laughs) well actually I don't want to spend too long talking about Diane de Poitiers, but I feel like she is important to bring up just to put Catherine's role at court into perspective. Well, I mean, and honestly, after all this is done, like, Catherine is only like, I mean, Diane, excuse me, is only like a a short little portion of her life anyway. Yeah, (laughs) but Kath, um, excuse me, Diane, it confuses me because legally my first name is Catherine and my second name is Diane. I know. That's why I'm (laughs) having problems too. I got a lot of (laughs) We're getting a little bit confused. But, so, Diane de Poitiers, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on her because I imagine... If Catherine de' Medici ever acquired a time machine and came into the future and discovered podcast, it would be the Katie and Nathan massacre. Learned about <laughs> podcast, listened to our podcast, and learned that we talked about Diane de Poitiers for a long time. She would be so upset. She'd probably come poison us or something. But <laughs> I do think it's important to like put everything in perspective. Diane de Poitiers <laughs> was Henry's tutor when he was a little boy before he got sent off to go be a hostage she was the one that actually handed him off to the spanish guys and (sighs) she let him give her her kiss on the cheek and the whole time he was in captivity his thought about her being like diane de poitier is like the ideal woman and His so little tutor just fell in love with her. Fell in love with her little boy crush, but then he comes back mm-hmm. and she becomes his mistress for the rest of her his life. Yeah, and and honestly like And she was hot. Oh yeah, my god. Yeah, she was if you look at them side by side like she was gorgeous. In our notes we have a picture of Kathy and Diane side by side. And she Diane, didn't stand a chance. Catherine Diane's did not stand like a chance. 20 something years older than Kathy and still Diane is definitely 
She's so beautiful. And poor Catherine, like, they didn't have kids for, like, ten years. Ten years. years. So, she obviously sitting there going, what am I doing wrong? Like, why is this guy not into me? Like, oh, my heart just breaks for her. It breaks for me so hard. The saddest thing, I think, is she would, um, so... She would drill a hole. I guess they didn't have drills then. Cut a hole. I don't know. She would somehow procure a hole (laughs) in the floor. Procure. (laughs) In the floor in the room above where Henry and Diane would sleep together. And she would watch them to be like, what am I doing wrong? Hoping that she would, like, get some tips on what she could do to make her husband happy. But she said in the end she didn't learn much because tears blurred her vision oh Oh, gosh that just like breaks my heart and then her brother dies uh henry's brother dies henry's brother dies and so now henry is next in line and And that's not that was like unexpected too oh no he died he died from playing tennis or something (laughs) like he went and played tennis and came back and got a cold and died i don't (laughs) know How do you how do you do that? The what, his, what's going on here? The history books are foggy here, to say the least. Uh, yeah, it's it's that time of year. And then at the same time, um, Pope Clemmy dies, and he hadn't fully paid out her dowry. And that's a big deal because this dowry was large and in charge. And so she hasn't had any kids, so she's not tied there. There was actually even a quote like some people were saying, "You should just." Send her away. Mm-hmm. Send this sterile womb away. Oh. Because she's not producing any kids. She's not paying her dowry. She's not. Francis. Send her away. Francis came af- after um, Pope Clemmy died. Francis said, this girl comes to me stark naked. Because she could, they, they couldn't pay off the rest of her dowry. Uh. And she hadn't had any kids. So she like, okay okay the fuck we gotta have a baby we gotta <laughs> have a baby so Kathy starts consulting like mystics and shit and she starts taking on like some really like unorthodox pregnancy uh, unorthodox is, a, is an understatement <laughs> <laughs> she she takes a mixture of cow shit and ground up deer antlers antlers like what the fuck and. Put that wrapped up in some linen down there. Oh my gosh, she must have had an infection. Oh, oh my gosh. I don't even want to think about that. Like, uh, and then she also like drank mixtures of blood and oh, urine to try to what? get pregnant. Like, oh my god. She went and traveled by mule because mules couldn't have couldn't produce children, and she thought that the infertility. Would be passed on to her. Okay, there were rumors that she drank ground up <laughs> unicorn horns. Unicorns? <laughs> I wonder if. What? <laughs> Was there some what? gay fellows out there with a, a special unicorn well, that they slay? What is it? Maybe a. What is, what is that ocean creature? Um, Narwhal? Didn't they have horns or something? Whatever it was, they ended up having doctors come out and look at them. Yeah, and they both said that they had slight deformities. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that uh, Well, okay. What I'll... does that mean, Nathan? <laughs> like, I have Googled it, and I've looked. Like, I've just tried to figure out, because they're like, okay. they both had slight deformities, and then the doctors told them what to do, and it was fixed, and all that. Like, in okay. my notes, it's <laughs> underlined, exclamation, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, no, I actually looked it up. Oh, thank God. And, like, there was a physician, like, hit the king's physician, Henry's physician, said that he, I didn't see anything on her. Oh. So, no deformities formities with her from what I've read but on his end his pee-pee hole wasn't right so oh. basically the technical term was his seminal opening was deformed so it depended on the position that because he did had it. a bastard at this point already yes so he, he could have children so everybody yes. was blaming it on Kathy but it, it was his pee-pee hole yeah and it was the position that he had sex with that person that should be the tagline for this episode pee-pee hole question mark <laughs> 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 Once again, a woman gets all the blame for being infertile I know, I know. or not having the but right But really, babies. it was. So, did that mean like only certain positions were? Yeah, so she was reading up on her Kama Sutra. Like, okay. she was. I don't think that was invented at that time either. No, yeah, no. It was, Kama it was, Sutra was around by then. But I don't know if they actually. I don't know that it was in practice it. in Catholic <laughs> France, but it was around. Um. So, th- so it was like. 
only certain positions that they hadn't tried in the 10 years were going to work for them. Well, basically. And I think maybe that's why, like, spying on people and, like, whenever she spied, maybe that helped. Or, like, whatever happened. After that, bam, bam, bam. They had 10 kids in 12 12 years. years. (laughs) Like, Jesus. Like, whatever. Whatever position they were doing. She was constantly in labor. was working. (laughs) King dies, and now she's queen. Her husband didn't really allow her any power. Like, no. like he was kind of an asshole to her. I mean, like, not, I don't know, like, not like a total asshole, but he wasn't, he never favored her. Yeah, he he would call her his regent when he left, but she had zero power. Yeah, like a it lot of- It was left up to the court. Like, I compare it to a similar time um, with Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. Whenever he would leave, he would leave- Catherine as the regent, but she was like effectively the regent. She was actually in power. Whenever Henry would leave, he would leave Catherine de Medici as the regent, but not really. No, like these other would, guys were in power. Yeah. Um, so she really didn't have any power. Um, and all the babies they had together didn't really save their relationship. Like they didn't. He didn't love her anymore. And you know, I actually heard, I hate to bring her up again, but Diane, um, she actually helped take care of the kids yeah. with her. Yeah. So that kind of gives you the dynamic of, like, she still has to support Oh, but, like, oh. he disrespected her so much. Like, there was this one chateau. How do you say it, Nathan? Chateau no. de Chins. Sh- Chenonche. Let's just call it the love shack. <laughs> Chateau we de ca- we ha- Y'all, we have tried to pronounce this so many times. <laughs> We're just going to call it the love shack. Chateau de love shack. The love shack. And Catherine wanted the love shack so bad. And she told everybody, like, I want this to be my property. But what does the king do? He gives it to Diane. What a bitch. And I'm talking about the king, bitch. <laughs> like, like deliberately. Like, it was such a fuck you to Catherine. And he like, would, like, even let... Diane sit on his lap. Like when they had like (laughs) people, like ambassadors from other countries, and like he'd have Diane sit on his lap while he talked to other ambassadors and shit. It was fucked up. Yeah, and Catherine was literally forced to pass things in court that benefited Diane. Because if she didn't, she looks like a catty bitch. Yeah, Yeah. and and it was she would have to sit by her husband and be like, "Yes, uh huh, I like her. She needs this too." And she really is just like, "What the hell?" Because there's actually like this little quote session between the two of them. (laughs) This cracks me. And it's basically like Diane Watson and and you know uh, Kath Demich. That's Catherine. Kath Demich. She's in. She's in the library just sitting there reading a book. And Diane's like, what you reading, bitch? And Catherine Meech just literally just was like, hmm, you know, I'm reading about the history of how whores have managed the business of kings. Mic drop. <laughs> Total fucking mic drop. Oh, like, oh, my God. You can tell that there's this hostility in oh. between these two women. Like, she basically just called her a whore. Oh, my like, God. <laughs> in 1559, they're like, okay, we need to start marrying these children off. Like, and she marries off her daughter to the king of Spain. Uh, and they have Phillip. this huge wedding. Big old celebration. Big old celebration. Just like when they got married, which was common in France. Two dynastic marriages happened. Like, countries came together. It was like a woohoo. It was a feast. Catherine herself was really into, like, the occult and, like, black magic, which is weird because she was also super Catholic, but whatever. She herself had had this dream of, like, foreboding. Like, something bad's going to go down. So she went to her astrologers, and they were also like, no, something bad is going to go down. And at this time in her life, Nostradamus was in her employ. And he probably said the same thing. And he was like, no, something bad's going to go down. (laughs) All the signs are saying. Oh, and Something bad happened. After, spoiler alert, alert, something (laughs) bad went down. After the wedding and all the days of celebration, the king, Henry, insisted on jousting. Oh, why? And he got a lance through the eyeball. That is so punk rock. Into that is the br- so it was, punk rock. This is the most punk rock way to die. It took him 10 days ten to die. 10 days. One, zero. And they didn't have, like, morphine back then. <laughs> nope. You didn't get a morphine drip. You just had 
to live it out until you died from jouster <laughs> through gosh. the eye. Oh. Like when me and Nathan were first talking about, um, I was introducing him to Catherine de' Medici, and I was describing this part, and I kept saying, and he was in a joust, so he got a jouster through the eye, and Nathan was like, do you mean a lance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true story. I was like, yes, yes, that is the word. And actually, did you know, like, whenever she died, uh, or she died, he died, whenever her hubby died, Mm. she actually wore black. And right now, that seems, oh, that's normal. She wore black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But back in the day, French women actually wore white whenever somebody died. Because it meant they were powerless. Yeah, they did. They were innocent. They didn't have anything. They couldn't do anything about it. But Catherine broke all of the rules and she wore black bitch and it and it actually like symbolized that she was grieving because she's wearing a color constantly for the rest of her life for the rest of her life she she wore wore black black. (laughs) for the rest of her life and it it also sent the message that she had power because she's changing this trend yeah like she's making it different Obviously, after her husband dies, there's somebody else that has to come up to power who's a male. And who is it? It happens to be her oldest son, Francis. But actually, the <laughs> queen at the t- the queen concert at the time was Mary, Queen of Scots, which I'm sure we'll talk about so sometime. She's bad and uh, bougie, but uh, she's actually a queen. I don't know if she's that bad. She's kind of stupid. But anyway, we'll get to her <laughs> when we get to her. But she's a child at this time, just like her husband was a child at this time. Francis, he was all of nine? How, no, no, 15. No, he was 15. He was, okay, so he wasn't quite a child. But he, was he was technically still, old enough to like run the country, but he was such a mama's boy. <laughs> he was such a mama's boy. So we want to intro... A major player at this time, which is the Guise family. Okay, you'll remember that day. The Guise family swoops in and tries to become, like, the de facto ruler while he's too young. Side note, the Guises are, like, super Catholic. Super Catholic. And this is a time in France where they're having religious wars. These are, the religious wars are really starting to pick up right now. And those will plague Catherine through the rest of her life. But at this point, the Guises swoop in. They want to become de facto rulers. But really, 15 at that point in time was viewed as old enough to rule on your own if you really wanted to. Yeah, and actually, what's really funny is that all the documents that were signed on his behalf, it says has his name and the queen, Lady Mother. Lady Mother. Lady Mother. Not his queen, (laughs) um, Mary, Queen of Scots. She's a Lady Mother. His queen... His lady mother. I just want to put a crown of flowers on her head. I know. And take a photo. <laughs> take a selfie. Could you imagine Catherine de' Medici at, like, Coachella? <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what the first thing she did in her power through Francis? What? By Diane de Poitiers. Bobby. But she, like, <laughs> took all her lands from her. She kicked her to the fucking curb. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, I mean, I, would do the same I feel thing. bad for Diane de Poitier, but I'm the same. I don't feel. I, 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 if I had a man who had a mistress, I would kick that bitch to the curb. Like, the curb. I feel bad, but I don't. <laughs> well, she you got know, to live in a palace for a while, like Diane did. Whatever. So. Yeah. Bye, bitch. She's gone. So we're not going to talk about her anymore. <laughs> um, the Jesus were like, really weird about Protestants oh, they and were, Catholics. And, they were real weird about and that Catherine, shit. Catherine, in my opinion, Catherine tried to negotiate and placate no, I the two think. sides and try to make Catholics and Protestants work together. And honestly, that's where I think she gets her bad reputation yeah. from is because she was trying to help both people so she was seen as a traitor. So she was trying to help both sides, but the Catholics, who obviously, still to this day, most French people are Catholic. Yep. So the Catholics obviously write history. So when it's like she was trying to make a peace between both sides, they're going to write her as she was a coward. She was trying to weak. give us over She's to the weak. devil. She's yeah. weak. But within a year, Francis dies of an ear infection. Fucking ear infection. (laughs) That must have been really horrible, though. Like, if you die from an ear infection, it's gotta be intense. I have never had an ear infection in my life. I have had a 
tons of them, and they are painful as hell. Don't you love living in the future where you're just like, I think I got an ear infection, and you go to the doctor, and it's like a minor inconvenience for two days and or it's something. Cured. I was like, <laughs> I, I totally could have died from ear infections back in the day. I know oh. I would have. So anyway, like Francis dies, and her second son, obviously, because he's the second son, mm-hmm. Char- Charlie the Ninth. Charlie <laughs> Nine. Call him Charlie Number Nine. He comes to power, and uh, the reason he's I call him nine. Charlie is because he's nine years old. He's nine years old, <laughs> and he's also the ninth. And he, he is totally... the ninth Charles, and he is also the ninth, and he cries at his coronation. Wait, wait, wait And his wait. mom has to come and, like, swoop in. Poor dude. <laughs> so, <laughs> this doesn't, like, set it up. Catherine mm-hmm. was in, in control here. So, this was the point in time in Catherine's life where she had the most power of her entire life. Because I think the age was, like, 14 or 15. Yeah. They had to be powerful. And she but, like... Was... He and was, he was nine. Like with Francis, like even though he gave her a little bit of power, he was still in power. And he was of age. If too. he knew he was gonna die, he could have like appointed other people to be in power for Charles, like regents or not regents. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like Lord Protectors oh, or yeah. whatever. But he didn't. So Catherine was just able to swoop in and be like, I'm in control while he's in his minority. And I'm going to start making the decision. And and boy, did she. Yeah, she did. She She ran the country. And side note, this country was like on the brink of war. If not, like parts of the country were already already in civil war. And it was all. South side, north side, west side, east side, all. It was the west side story, basically. (laughs) No, but it was um, Catholics versus Protestants. And they called their Protestants Huguenots, and I don't, I don't know why. Why not Huguenot? It's, it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't even. And so these are the people that you need to know, the major players. So we've already talked about the Guise family. Yeah. So and they were, they're they're aligned with. They're the, the crown. major Catholics, and um, so the major Catholics are the Guise family and um, the Crown. The, like the already active royal family. And then the Huguenots. It's going to be the Bourbon family. And they actually had, uh, take note of this name, uh, Henry Navarre. Mm-hmm. And that was one of their children. He's in and, the Bourbon family. And this dude named Admiral Coligny. Coligny was like a super important, like he was the leader of the Huguenots, even though he wasn't in the royal family. Keep that name in mind. He's a fucking admiral. But the Bourbons were, like, they were the next cousin. So technically... They were the next in line. They're the next in line. If everybody in the current royal family dies out, they're the next in line. And they're Protestants. Um, Charles actually, like, lives out to be of age Old to enough rule, to run to run the show. But he doesn't really run the show. <laughs> he lets Kathy do everything for him for the rest of his life. Catherine dusts off her hands and she's like, I need to get some dynastic work here. I need to marry my kids into some like important families. Because to be quite honest with you, she tried a lot of diplomatic solutions to like Protestant Catholic, like trying to make them work together. There was actually a law that she passed where she said well, you can't practice Protestantism in Paris, but you can do it on the outskirts of Paris. Yeah. So she's trying to compromise, and nobody liked that. Nobody liked no. it. The Huguenots hated it. The Catholics hated it. So she was like, all she right. She was in a lose-lose situation. All right, I'm just going to start marrying my babies off. Yeah. And I'm going to start doing it that way. So, so Charlie Nine marries um, Elizabeth of Austria. They had one daughter, right? They had one daughter, but, like, she died when she was, like, five. But also, at this time, like, daughters didn't matter because they couldn't inherit, which is super sexist, but whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't... Okay, so we've already talked about uh, the Francis of Spain marrying her daughter Elizabeth. Yeah. That's another marriage Mm -hmm. that she arranged. Mm -hmm. She also married off... Her daughter, Margot, yeah. with Henry Navarre, which I told you to we take note of. We will get into that hardcore in a moment. Something I do want to talk to talk about, her youngest son, whose name was also Francis, because she's fucking lazy, I guess. <laughs> but they, at the end, whenever he became um, Duke, they called him Hercules? Yeah, that was originally what his name was, was like Hercules Francois something or other. Oh, but so after he became Duke, they named Francois. him. It was Francois. So, um, the youngest Francis was actually for a time being considered a marriage prospect for Elizabeth I of England. 
And she only had like three serious marriage prospects, and that's one of, that was the last of hers. She was like 40, and he was like 20, and she called him her little frog. And I think ever since then, <laughs> little frog, Francis. <laughs> Francis was kind of a sort of aligned with the Protestants. Oh no, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <clears throat> he was super into the Protestants after that because he thought it would get him the English more crown. power. Yeah, and so yeah, that's yeah. like he's now Protestant, but she's like, wait a second, I didn't mean this. But anyway, yeah. anyway, it doesn't work out though because Elizabeth of England is smart and she decides to never marry because that's the only way a woman can be powerful back then. And we want to now talk about her daughter Margot's marriage to Henry of Navarre. Okay, so this should have been perfect. On this paper. should have been perfect. Okay, perfect. so just to recap, Navarre, the family that is ruling Navarre, is like the first cousins to the current royal family. So if all the first royal family dies out, this is who's going to step in place. And they're Protestants. And so she's like, I'm going to marry my Catholic daughter to one of their Protestant princes. And we are going to be, like, harmonizing. We're going to solve all the problems. But... Well, let's just talk about what happens. Picture it. Paris, 1572. So the two were married at Notre Dame. It was not a love match. It was... They were not into each other. But they both kind of recognize this is the good thing to do for the country. And of course, true to the Medici way, there was a big old party. Big old party. Huge, these royal weddings and leaders all came to celebrate. No, like so many Protestant leaders came into Paris, which was like 95% Catholic. I do think this is interesting, though. So they got married outside of Notre Dame. But then she had her religious ceremony inside of Notre Dame. So she had her Catholic wedding inside She had her Catholic... With her brother acting in proxy <laughs> of her husband. Like, basically... Because in, in the Catholic religion, you have to be Catholic. You have to, to be Catholic, Catholic to get married in a Catholic church. So they set up a proxy wedding with the, the Catholic uh, brother. Like, that's oh so my gosh. crazy. Shady shit. But anyway. <laughs> so the tensions in Paris were already really high. They were, like, in a recession. And was, here they are, like, throwing all these parties. Yeah. And being, like, it was like, I can't put food on the table for our, my family every night, but here's these fucking Protestants that you're giving food to and just like wasting like and it was it, it was it was bad news bears really so i mean this is the marriage between margo and to be honest margo wasn't actually faithful she was not in no she was never faithful actually <laughs> it's really interesting um margo was Catherine de medici's least favorite child and um a few years before this when henry was still alive Margot was having an affair with one of the Guise sons. Surprise, surprise. And she, when her mother and father found out, they dragged her out of bed and beat her. Like, beat the shit out of her. <laughs> that was the time oh. period. That was the time period. But also, yep. like, this marriage, the Pope was not cool with. He was like, I'm not going to sanction it. No. And that was such, like, that was unheard of. That was unprecedented for... Like a Catholic monarchy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so this wedding day comes and goes. And they are partying hard. Mm -hmm. And after four days of the wedding, Coligny, who you remember was a Huguenot leader, was snipered. Straight up snipered. Shot from a window and had to have his finger fucking amputated. Like, for real. And, okay, Catherine got blamed for it. She got blamed for it because she was an easy target. But what... In I mean, my opinion, in my opinion, here's my evidence. The Guises had somebody outside on their balcony, and there was... A smoking gun was found on their balcony, On their right? balcony, and it was just so happened to be in line with shooting of this guy, and... How are you going to have a gun at your house that smo- the literal smoking gun? Literally smoking gun. I don't think Catherine had anything to do with it. I don't think think Catherine had anything to do with it, but I wouldn't be super surprised to learn that she did either. But I think, I I really do think from heart of hearts, it was the geese, because Catherine had tried for so long to bring peace between the two. Yeah, and she even, like, went to visit him on his, the one on his deathbed, sickbed. 
Like, after he got shot, she showed up in tears and, like, offered to put prayers up for him. So, half of history looks at that like, oh, that's a grieving queen who wants her country to be healed. The other half of history looks at it like she was setting it up. Like, the lady doth protest too much. (laughs) That's exactly what it was. So, that night, the Huguenot leaders come to Kathy while she's at dinner, and they are like, we want justice. We want justice for the shit that has happened to our leader. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. Let me talk to my son. Go away. The leaders who, like, all their council, which is obviously all Catholic, is like, hey, they shouldn't talk to you that way. They are They are the Protestants. They're the Protestants. They're demanding things that aren't okay. They're here. We're afraid of what's going to happen. Basically, they convinced her and Charlie Nine that if we don't, Nip this in the bud, it's going to be a bigger problem. And by nipping it in the bud, they're like, okay, here's this list of people that we think lead the Protestants, and let's off every single one of them. Uh, and okay. it, it said that Charlie was like driven to the point that he was like, fine, just do it. Just it, do it. His <laughs> quote is saying, being like, well, then so be it. Kill them, but kill them so that they cannot come back. They presented Charlie with this list, and there's been disputes. The list was maybe a dozen people. The list was maybe three dozen people. But imagine for each Protestant leader, he's got a crew, and maybe he's got 10 to 20 people in his crew. So obviously, those all have to be off too. A dozen people. So it was always going to be a massacre, but I don't think anybody thought... It was going to be the massacre it turned into because it was fucking carnage. Carnage. And they call it the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. This was a game changer for her. So this was four days after that, that wedding. And it was just like... Some people say that there was 3,000 killed. Some people say there was 70,000 killed. Somewhere in there, even 3,000 people, that's a lot of fucking people killed. The very first person they go, they go to um, Colony's room, and they run him through with a sword. Like, he's still recovering from his shot in his arm. They run him through with a sword, throw him out a window, and he's beheaded in the streets. Oh, that's extreme No, but this dude was gangster. When he realized they were coming for him, he told his squad... Save yourself if you can save yourself. Don't I don't want anybody hanging around for me. Because I'm gonna die. And they were and um <laughs> one of the cronies, one of the geese's cronies that had him oft even noted like, Y'all, he died with like the most bravery I've ever seen him. Like he looked me straight in the eye. You know what I mean? Ugh, like that's so extreme. Ooh. And then also another well. It's the wedding of Henry and Margo, yeah. like, shortly before that. And they spare. And Henry is Protestant. So they, they even go to Henry, and they're like, uh, sorry, we're going to have to take you into custody. No, so they go, <laughs> they accost Henry and his brother. We're walking to go, like, play tennis. Hey, we're going to take you into custody. And they're like, what? What for? What's going on? But then they start to slaughter their crew. And one of the crew, like, breaks away and runs to Margot's room. Because she's staying with the... She's staying at the Navarre household. And, like, hides behind her and... Save me! Save me! Save me! Could you imagine just waking up and a bloody man behind you being like, save me? Be like, okay. So she... (laughs) She saves this man. And that's my one thing that I'm like, maybe... Catherine really didn't have anything to do with this because her daughter was staying with the Protestants. Yeah, but also, it, makes sense. it was her least favorite child. But at the same <laughs> so point, maybe... like you wouldn't even do that to your least favorite child. Like, I hope. I wouldn't. I, I... Either way. Shit got out of hand. Shit got <laughs> out of hand. Hand. Okay. It apparently, just... apparently, uh, there was actually the one of the geezers came out on the balcony and was like. It is the king's command. Kill them all. It is the king's command. Like, he was preaching. If if the king said kill them all, he meant kill all the people on the list. But what they took it as was kill 
all the Protestants. But it was the geese that did it. Because yeah. That's, to be honest with they you, the St. Such... Bartholomew's massacre, I think it was the Guises. Yeah. I think they orchestrated does, but the But does whole history, thing. when you Google Bartholomew Day Massacre, what comes up? is Catherine de' Medici. Well, it's because it's, so it's way easier to blame on one person than yeah. it is to an entire family. But anyway, people were like, I mean, like, civilians. Like, I mean, Normal Paris was killed. already, like, a pretty Catholic city, but they were just, like, pulling Protestants out of their house. And it didn't them, like, just, like, mother, it daughter, stop son, in Paris. father. It didn't like, stop in Paris. It like, ended up going to all, like, the suburbs, like, exactly. the provinces, what they called them. This lasted... So St. Barth- Bartholomew's Day is the end of August. This lasted to the end of October. That's months of slaying. I read somewhere um, the massacre was not a day. It was a season. And that broke my heart. They basically blamed Catherine for being like a puppet of the Pope. And doing this massacre to further the Catholic religion. But honestly, I still think that she spent all this time in her life trying to bridge the gap. I don't think she would have. Obviously, if Charlie it. Nine gave the okay to kill the people on the list, then she, she gave had the to. okay on the she people had on the list. To. But she never for a moment expected it would become what it became. But the Pope supposedly did like a jig. He was like, yeah, France killing all the Protestants. Gonna do a dance. But either way, the Huguenot religion went down to about a quarter of what it had once been, and it was a mixture of killings and people converting. Because I mean, I don't know about you, I would have converted. I would have converted too. I would have been like, oh, I think okay, I'm Catholic now. I would have been, yeah. Okay, okay, no, cool, cool. Give me a rosary, please. <laughs> Let me take some communion. We never will know if she really orchestrated it or she didn't. Still to this day, that is her legend. That is her. Oh, don't we don't know. know. We don't know. And, and I, I mean, her know. reputation took a hit at that hard point. hit, especially like after. What Charles do you think? Died. What do you think, though? Do you think she? What do you think? I honestly don't think that she. I think I that think she, she did either. She signed off on a couple of people. I think she signed off on the list. I think and she was going to do it. There. I think she was going to do it like Lucrezia Borgia style and mm. just like poison him and kill him. And what she do that yeah. sort of like assassination in silence? I don't think she realized it was going to be like this mass. All of a sudden, all this one, shit happens. One nasty thing that supposedly happened was um, when Henry Navarre converted, because he, he very shortly converted to Catholicism, like during the massacre, she turned to an ambassador and laughed. Ugh. But is that real? Is that propaganda? Like, we don't know. Probably both. Maybe a little bit of both. Whoever knows. Ugh. So not long after that, Charlie Nine dies. And okay, his her last... reputation is already slaughtered, though. And his last words were, "My mother, mm. my mother." I guess that's kind of sweet. Mama's boy. <laughs> but if I was his wife, I'd be like, "Fine, bitch." The next son is supposed to come up, and that's Henry the Third. Yeah. And he was he... elected as the king of Poland. So he was the king of Poland because Poland had elected him king of Poland. So he was he was his favorite or he was her favorite son. Which I don't like also I feel kinda of bad. Yeah. Like, if my mom was just one day like, Oh, that's my favorite kid, I'd be like, Oh, okay. Oh, uh, fucking bitch. <laughs> but, but but it was very an open like oh my favorite ki- my favorite son has well, come even home to be king. The kids, like, she called him Cherieu, which is precious eyes <laughs> that's what my, know, mom maybe had, maybe, my mom only had three kids so maybe if she had 10 kids she would have been more picky about <laughs> right. her favorite. so of course like after charles dies he's like okay bye poland bye poland bye. Coming Hello, on to france. france i'm about to run this shit but he actually like i read before, like, going to France, he's like, I'm going to k- take a quick detour to Venice. And so, that- I looked at a map. <laughs> Poland to Venice is, to France. Is, is, it's is, not, like, on the way. No. It's not, like... <laughs> he's kind of a... I'm just going to say He's just like, it. yo, wait for me. I'll be there in a year. I'm going to say it. Henry the Third was a diva. 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 Like, he was like, no, hold on. You want me to be king? 
I'm gonna go to Venice first and have a good old time. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> Give me a year. So, I mean, let's just say that he was honestly the only one that was of age to be No, king. it was the first one of her children that was, like, actually old enough to be king when he came to power. And, I mean, he was a little, how shall we say? Um, Flamboyant. A little bit gay. Uh, but there were rumors of it, and there were rumors of him being, like, bi. And there's also, like, this, maybe they were doing that to try to discredit the crown. And maybe they were trying to... No, I think he was just a little bit Okay, gay. so he he had, he reduced the size of the court around him. So basically, Kath de Medici, who's Catherine, is totally, like, you have to keep your council large and keep the nobility in charge. And he was like, bye, bitch. And he was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Like, basically, at this point in time, um, Kathy lost all her power. And she was done. Like, he loved her, but he didn't trust her as an advisor, which was stupid. Yeah, and he, like, reduces the size of his court and then appoints all these, like, pretty young thing men as his, like, counsel. I want to love you. P-Y-T. And so, it, it, he calls them their mignons, which is cuties. I didn't know that. I didn't know that's what that meant. <laughs> like, these ah. men, these men are not only just, like, bros. They, like, dress in, like, feathered hats and lots of makeup, even, like, gayer than the gay, 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 gay. He obviously did not produce any heirs. A big old goose egg on the zero oh, children. Oh, and zero at this children. point, it must such such be, like, a dagger in the heart to Kathy that, like, she's had all these children and none of them have had any heirs. Not a single one. And so, like, Henry is totally alienating everyone at this oh, point. Oh, no. All of France hates him. The Huguenots, the Catholics, I mean, everyone is like, this guy is weird. There was, like, a rumor of him, like, dressing in a bejeweled outfit as a woman. So, if you think about these religious times, this dude it doesn't stand a chance. And he no. pissed off everybody. So, now he has no heirs, no body to be around him. And now, Francis, baby Francis Hercules... He dies. He dies. He's he doesn't marry. And they weren't uh, the best England. of friends either. They no. weren't the best of friends either. And so, so the geezes step in. They're of like, course they. They're would. like, you know what? Ugh. If you look at the actual line of su succession, it should go to the Bourbons, but they're Protestants, so put us in charge. And what they did is they literally were like, "Hey, Pope, say that he's un unfit to be the the king because yeah. he's not Catholic." Yeah. And the Pope totally like, did. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little pope. I'm a little pope. I'll say it's okay. <laughs> You're not the king, Henry Navarre. <laughs> oh, and like, it's, it's not, it was not a good idea. And so the Guises end up like aligning with Spain. And Spain is, obviously they've always been at war. And Spain's like uber Catholic. But Henry feels like you've gone around my fucking back. But hey, come over for dinner on Christmas Day. And I mean, Catherine even tries to negotiate and be like, hey, yo, you gonna... Oh, Catherine tries to negotiate until her face dying is day. blue. Like, until her literally, dying Literally, literally. Day. On this one, she like says, hey, you Huguenots, you need to get out or convert or we're gonna kill you. And the Guises don't think that that's far enough. So, not only do they say that Navarre isn't fit to be king, they start to try to make Henry, and they corner him into signing a contract that puts Cardinal Bourbon, which you would think would be Protestant, but no, it's he's like, not. It's like, he's, well, he's Cardinal. So of that's, the Bourbon yeah. area. And he's actually super Catholic and super old. Like, he was gonna die. And so they appointed him him yeah. as the leader and then after that it would be the Guise as the lieutenant general. Mm -hmm. So basically the Guises were running shit. Henry was like, I just want to invite all the Guise over for a Christmas celebration. <laughs> and was it ever a celebration? He murdered them all. Slayed. He was just like, y'all want to tell me what to do? You know, like. On Christmas Day. Christmas like, Day. Merry Christmas. I got you a present. What is that? Oh, it's a tombstone. You're mm, dead, bitch. Mm. And so apparently, like, right before that, Catherine literally pulled herself out of her deathbed 
and was like, I'm going to try to make one last deal between this Cardinal of Bourbon and my son, Henry, and mm. try to make a, a pact. I don't think Catherine would have ever sanctioned this kind of... It, it, did, no, it, it, no, no, it, no. it didn't happen. She wasn't part of the deal. No, and no, then no. she just, like, she took herself off the deathbed, tried to say something, didn't work, went back, and then her final dying words were, I can do no more. Does your heart just... Break? I think that speaks to her legacy. My heart just breaks. She tried. She tried to make France a peaceful place. She adopted this place as like, this is where my children are from. This is where I live. And like, she tried. She but tried they to like unite. Just wanted to murder each other. I mean, other. it was called the War of Religions. Like, what could she and, do? <laughs> and she was trying to make these religions like bond and be together and like. Hey, guess what? You're all fucking Christian, and we all believe in the same shit. I know! So why are we fighting over this? And that's what I think her legacy is. So when she died, her son, is it Henry? Which was the son? (laughs) There's there's a ton of them. Her son, Henry, who was king at the time, was in hiding because he was a cowardly folk. She died, and so she couldn't be buried in Paris like queens were usually buried. So she was buried in Beloy, I think is how you pronounce that, or how Bly. do you Beloy? Uh, she was buried somewhere else in a place that we don't know how to pronounce. And it's it's miles and miles and miles away from France. And Paris, so she had Paris. like a big old like royal ceremony there. But the <clears throat> ten years later, after her death, she was reburied in Paris. And the woman that commissioned her place to be buried was a woman named Diane. Diane de Franc, that was Henry, her husband's only bastard child. Not with Diane de Poitiers. It was with... uh, With some other woman who he just was like, you're going to name your bastard after Diane de Poitiers, I guess. And that woman had her buried. Let's talk about her family legacy. Henry III, who was like the last shining grace of his going to be... The end of this family. A couple of years after she died, was attacked by like a crazy monk and killed, like stabbed a hundred times or whatever. So then, her daughter was married to the king of Navarre. Wait, so he became the king of France. And her daughter is Margot. Margot, who they hated each other. But she was married to Henry, so they she became fucking queen. She became queen of France, but they hated each other, and she petitioned. For a divorce just as much as he did. So they eventually got a divorce so she could go live off the rest of her time in a convent. But really at that time, that just meant freedom for a woman. You That meant you could do what you wanted with your life. And Henry Navarre came from the bourbon line of the yeah. family. His second wife, guess what her surname is? What? His Suspense. second wife's name was Marie de Medici. This was another Medici. She became the Queen of France and she started the bourbon line. Which went on until Louis the Sixteenth. Marie and, Antoinette, yeah, obviously. That's what it went on to. So, so the end of that line. So. so we saw the end of the Valois family and the beginning of the Bourbon. That was... She had a life. And I think a lot of it was forced on her with especially like the, the obviously the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Yeah. Like to me that was the Guise family trying to rid the world of the Protestants to make way for their own... Thing. So that was Catherine de' Medici. Um, it was definitely our longest episode so far because she was the queen that lived the longest that we've covered, and she just had a really interesting and complicated life. So we hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please find us and follow us on all the places where you follow people. We are on Facebook. Queen's Podcast. We're on Twitter, Queen's underscore podcast. Um, and you can find us on iTunes. It's smushed together, one word, Queen's Podcast. Please, if you like the show, uh, rate us. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if there's anything you want to hear, please let us know. Um, we think Boudica might be our next episode, which I'm pretty excited about. But if there's somebody out there that you just think, look, Get your shit together. Talk about her. Let me know. Um, email us at queenshistorypodcast at gmail.com. 
Or send us a message through our website, queenspodcast.lipson.com. Thanks for listening. Our intro 